Hi everyone, my name is Will de Beaurepair and I wish you a very warm virtual welcome to our discussion today about my little family, family's winery here in Australia. Um, I've prepared a little presentation. One of the great advantages of using Zoom and this new format of videos is I can share a lot more, but there's quite a bit to go through. We aren't a classic Australian winery. There's a lot more um, background to our decision making behind where we decided to make our wine and the styles of wine we, we actually make today and you're getting to enjoy a couple of them. Um, without much more ado, I will start the presentation because it'll all hopefully come clear as we go along. So bear with me for a second. So as you can see here, nice little green background. This is the opening to our, our one, one direction of looking across our vineyard. Um, importantly is the French and spirit and Australian and body, body because who is De Beau Repair Wines? Um, this winery was established by my parents, Richard and Janet, back in 1998. Um, interestingly, the previous generation, my dad's aunt and uncle, um, has first started making wine in the Yarra Valley in 1970. So as a family, we've been making wine in Australia for nearly 50 years. But um, the name itself isn't an English name, it's, it's a French name, and actually more specifically, it's a Burgundian name. Inter from an Australian perspective, the wine industry here was mainly developed by the English, the Italians and the Germans. The French were notably absent, probably because for much of the early history of Australia, France and England weren't on the best of terms. Um, but from us and the way that we view it, being a Burgundian family, our name actually has a very good meaning. I think it has a great re reflection with the winery that we, that we have built. Bow means beautiful or good, repair means hideaway. So we are of a beautiful hideaway. Um, and that is very much the ethos that we've built this around. This is a destination vineyard. It's all about the vineyard, very much that French approach. And that's a very important delineation. I think you'll understand as you go through this presentation. Um, from all of that, we were able to win Best Wine in Australia in 2018. So this was out of about 10,000 wines judged. It was the first time in 40 years of that competition that a winery from New South Wales won that trophy. So we are traditionally Victorian. The Yarra Valley is a great wine region just near Melbourne. We are now located at Ralston, which is just near Sydney. So I'll give you a little bit of an explanation of that. Obviously a nice map of Australia here. Um, as you can see down here, Melbourne, Canberra and Sydney, which hopefully you're all fairly familiar with. And this little red flag shows where we are. So the Arrow Valley is down here, just near Melbourne. Obviously we're up here in New South Wales. And here gives you on the right, gives you a much clearer um, picture of where we are. Sydney down here on the bottom right. You drive out here, this is called the Blue Mountains or the Great Dividing Range. Magnificent countryside, it's all national parks forests, mountains, cliffs, very dramatic scenery. And we are just on the western side of that range, which is uh, quite important as you'll discover in this presentation at this little town called Ryleston. It's near Mudgee, which you may be aware of. It's about 10,000 people or Bathurst down here, which is quite famous for its university. So still very much in these blue mountains and the ranges, and uh, it gives you an understanding of where we're located. So in terms of the way that we've approached, as I indicated, we've approached this as French Australians. Um, we see ourselves as stewards of our, of our land and honouring in particular our Burgundian ancestors. We, we are and seek to make what is called a French winemaking style. Um, if you're really wondering what that is, it really what we're looking for are wines that are elegant, they're balanced. So we're talking here about acid and flavour uh, in particular, so they feel very balanced on the palate and they're age-worthy styles. It's quite easy, or not that easy, but, but it's much simpler to make a great wine that lasts a couple of years than to make one that can remain great over 10 to 20 to 30 years. And that's the real benchmark against which great wines are judged. And look, most importantly, we're trying to capture the variations of our vintages. You know, you can't, um, fight mother nature, you've got to work alongside her now more so than ever. And with the French, you know, it's all about the vineyard and that location. So you want to capture what you've got, where you come from, your provenance. And you're trying not to intervene too much. You're trying to hold back 
the wine making. And most importantly, we're also trying to regenerate the land, not just sustainable, but trying to actually improve the land on which the vineyard is located. And we do that using various um, approaches. So things like green manures, rebuild the soil structures and rebuilding native and flora. Um, biodiversity zones around it, which actually have an enormous advantage in the vineyard because you have great pollinators and you also have great natural predators of a lot of the bugs that cause the diseases that, that historically we've had to spray harsh chemicals to control. So we're really here about working with our environment, within our environment, and trying to make great wines that reflect that environment. And that is the French approach. So um, when you talk about um, wines here in Australia, you, you tend to have, you tend to hear the use of cool climate versus warm climate. Um, you may, that may be evident overseas, but I've noticed Australian wines overseas tend to be fairly generic where they have no regionality beyond say Southeast Australia, or maybe a couple of the very famous original wine regions. Here on the right actually shows in black all the Australian wine regions. There are a lot of them. There are 14 alone in the state of New South Wales. Um, but they, in Australia, you tend to hear a lot of the wine uh, media and the, the journalists, the sommeliers, and they talk if it's a cool climate, it's great. If it's a warm climate, it's not great. It's very misleading. Um, it's much more about the variety, the grape variety. So if you're planting French varieties, so the Cabernets, the Chardonnays, the, the Pinot Noirs, um, the semillons, yes, you want something that's a bit cooler because that's the way that the acidity and the ripeness um, really lends itself towards. But if you're planting a Spanish variety like Tempranillo or Grenache, or even some of the new Portuguese varieties that are becoming quite, quite trendy, or the Southern Italian varieties, the Nero de Avalos in particular, which are very trendy these days, you want to be in a warm climate. They do not develop um, properly in a cool climate. And this is all to do with working with nature. These varieties have evolved over thousands of years to work in their environment. And so if you find the environment similar in Australia, you want that Southern Italian variety, you need to find an area in Australia that, that feels or the climate is similar to the Southern Italian climate. So for us, French, Burgundian in particular, we're looking at the cooler end. And you can see that obviously the French regions are light blue, this is important, but it's not the whole story at all. Um, but in, interestingly, we're right down here at the very cool end. This is Tasmania, that little island just off south of Australia, and then Central Otago and New Zealand, a very famous area now, growing fantastic wines. Um, so the way though the French look at it, they look at it much more holistically. So they use a term called terroir, and terroir is, is the combination, yes, of that climate, but it's not just temperature, it's location. Is it on the coast? So is it a coastal or maritime climate or is inland continental climate? Is there hills and folds and valleys? Is, are you below tree lines? Are you above tree lines? Is there a wall adjacent to your vineyard that may pull the cold air behind it, hold back the cold air as it gradually slides down a hill on a very cold morning? Um, so your topography is really important for that. Are you along a river? It's actually increasingly, incredibly important, especially for sweet wine production. Obviously, the flora and fauna, as I said, the trees around it, but also the native or, and, and sometimes the introduced um, species. But we're talking everything down here, lady beetles, which are magnificent predators of most of the pests in the vineyard. It's quite incredible when you think of how beautiful a little ladybird is, but the most pests, they're terrifying. And um, most importantly, it's the soils. And we'll talk a little bit about what, what influence soils have to play in the vineyard. And it's quite a substantial role. The most, I guess, the, the real catch all is here in Australia, you hear a lot of discussion about winemaker. Um, I tend to avoid the term. I tend to, if I'm going to use the term, it's wine grower. We grow wine because the vineyard makes the wine. In France, there is actually no term for winemaker. The term is vigneron, and vigneron is all about the vines, the vin, and that's why um, when you're talking about it with from this whole French approach is Australia classically 
takes it from the winery, and you see that with a lot of the big wines that you probably approach overseas. They're the blends of hundreds of vineyards. There is no provenance or local personality. It's a real tour de force of a winemaker who is taking a lot of different ingredients and producing a wine and trying to produce a consistent product. But in that process, you can sometimes lose the personality. Whereas the French are the vineyard, the personality of that vineyard. Put that in a bottle, don't mess it up, is their approach. So vigneron, not winemaker, is the French approach. So if you take this back a little bit, remember that we had that vertical axis, axes on the, uh, before we're talking about temperatures, so this is still the same. Now, but they've all been spread out, all these regions, and it's because of this horizontal axis, the acidic, neutral, and alkaline. And this has to do with soil. So I'm not sure if you have to dig back to your school chemistry classes. It makes it a lot more interesting talking about chemistry and geology and biology when you're using wine as the crutch or as the demonstration tool. But the way to think of it is, is obviously, is most soils are classically quite acidic, especially older soils. Australia has quite old soils. We're one of the, we're the oldest land mass in the world. Some of the original rocks here are some of the earliest. So they've been leached with a lot of rain, which rain is quite acidifying. And a lot of soils, if they come from volcanic soil, and particularly your basalts and your granites are quite acidic. And that's why a lot of Australian regions are on the reasonably acidic soils. Whereas you notice that all the French regions are within this zone here where they're mildly alkaline. And alkaline, you know, is the opposite of acidic. Um, and thinking sodium bicarbonate, well, bicarbonate soda, um, which is great for um, unsettled stomachs. That's um, alkaline to an extent. And uh, so all of their, their French regions have gravitated to this fairly concentrated position within um, this temperature versus soil type. And that's been through a process of thousands of years of trial and error. There were vines planted in many more locations in France than there are today. So, and over time, the successful ones were what, which were allowed to continue and were invested in, and they are the regions that we now have today. And over that time as well, the varieties worked themselves out too. So starting at taking back to us, to France, with our mentality. Let's talk a little bit about the French um, regions and particular Burgundy, our homeland. And so Burgundy, as you will see, this is like a nice big couple of target circles, some squiggly lines. They really do actually are quite simple to understand. But what you'll probably pick up very quickly is where Burgundy is located. Here, right in the middle of France. It's called the stomach of France for a good reason. A lot of French cuisine, a lot of French cooking styles and food styles come from Burgundy. You'd be surprised how many, um, but also obviously great wine too. So wine and food are a great evolutionary match. They've evolved together. And you'll be surprised when you start going to the region and you drink their traditional food with their wine, it starts to make sense. So in terms of the food matches, in terms of the wine style, um, they have evolved. So I'll explain some of these little squiggly lines. So as I said, so Burgundy is right in the middle. So it's 400 kilometers from La Manche, the, the English Channel, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic. It is not a coastal climate. It's not like Singapore. It's not like Sydney. It's a fair way inland. And what happens there is you, you lose the regulating temperature influence of the ocean. The ocean doesn't change temperature that much regardless of season it doesn't heat up and cool down in summer and winter that much um, so it makes it quite enjoyable to live by the ocean um, as you move further from the ocean as you move further inland you lose that influence of the of the ocean and you end up with this environment which has hot days cold nights big temperature changes overnight um, if any of you have been out in the desert you will have seen that especially when the soils can't retain heat. It loses all the heat at night, it gets brutally cold, even in summer. So this is what an inland climate is like. So it's called a diurnal variation. It means a big difference between nighttime temperature and daytime temperature. And that's where you can see here, it's climate oceanic, 
with an influence of the continent. So this is this green zone is where Bur is Burgundy is located. And I've got a little picture here, which just effectively the saying is, obviously uh, there's a large heating up and a large cooling down um, over the day. What that means from viticulture is obviously vines and plants. They rely on photosynthesis, the sunlight to drive that engine of growth, but also the development of sugar within a grape. So it drives the ripening process, the sunlight drives the ripening process of fruit. And in this environment, it's a slower process because there's warmth during the day. Optimal photosynthesis is actually 26 degrees Celsius. So as you get too hot or too cold, you know, it, it isn't optimal, it slows down or, or sometimes happens too quickly. And so you have this photosynthesis during the day and it's all working lovely, then at night, it closes, the doors slam shut and it slows right down. It takes a while to pick up and then take off each day. So that stop, start, stop, start process means that the, the ripening of the fruit happens in a more steady manner, which gives the ability for not just the development of sugar, which is alcohol, but the development of flavor, which is so important. You know, we're not trying to make an alcohol, we're trying to make wine. And wine's about flavor. It's about structure. And those come from a much steadier form of ripening, in particular with the varieties that we're talking about in Burgundy, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which have naturally very thin skins. And those thin skins, to give you a, 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 an idea, um, why they need to thicken. Because if you want to understand the importance of skin, look at a rosé. A rosé is just a red wine, a red grape, without the use of skins in winemaking. So you can imagine the thicker the skins, the more skins are involved, particularly with Pinot Noir, a red variety, the more flavor um, and the more structure is imparted. And that brutalizing cold and hot day also makes the skins thicken up or bruise, depending which way you want to look at it. So they become a little bit thicker again. Once more, more flavor, more structure. And that's sort of the secret to Burgundy's thicker skins. Um, and and flavour some wine structures, perhaps against uh, New World Pinot Noirs being grown on the coast. So that's sort of, I guess, a little bit of an introduction in terms of the climate, important, very important, cold, hot, diurnal, Mediterranean. But if it was just about temperature and being 400 kilometres from the coastline, why is Burgundy, and this is a planting map of Burgundy, so narrow in its plantings? So you're talking here, the best bit of Burgundy is, is, is the two areas. One is Chablis, the other is this area called the Côte de Bois, um, and it's broken up in the Côte de Bone and the Côte de Nuit. That's the Côte de Bone here and Côte de Nuit up here. And it's only, that's only 60 kilometers long. But more importantly, it's only about a kilometer wide, and some of the best bits are only a couple of hundred meters wide. So if it was climate, but why, and location, why is not every single valley um, planted with vines? This is one valley, and a very small part of that valley is planted with the best vines in the world. So there's obviously a much larger influence of play than just climate. So that was important from a, from a general regional perspective, but where to actually plant the vineyard in that region? It's, of, it's much more a geology um, exercise. This is, before we get a little bit going, oh my gosh, there's too much color going on here. This is a geology map of, of France. The way to think of this is, is, as you'll notice, you've got two things here. You've got, notice the Aquitaine Basin, which is down around Bordeaux, Southwest France, and you've got the Paris Basin, which covers most of Northern France. And you have to go back 150 million years ago. This was um, the era uh, it's called the Jurassic era, the era of Sam Neill and Jurassic Park. But on a serious level, we're in the area where all the continents, uh, especially of the Northern Hemisphere, were combined together into this supercontinent called Pangaea. And as it started to break apart, the sur seas surrounding rushed in to the, into the gaps, into the lower areas and into the moving apart continents. And it started covering up various parts um, of the land. And, that covered up the, the low points like the Paris Basin and the Aquitaine Basin. So at that time, these were very shallow seas. The continent was also located on or around the equator, much like Singapore. And so it was much warmer. So you had these warm, shallow seas, which were teeming with, with sea life 
and their coasts were covered in shellfish. And that's the really, really important part of it. As you can see here, um, this is really narrowing down. You can see Burgundy is located just here on the coastline. The Champagne was actually just off the coast. It was actually out in the shallow sea. It was, Burgundy was on the coast. And why, um, why is that important? Well, if you've ever uh, you know, looked into whales, you'll understand that they eat plankton. So plankton are some very microscopic sea life. Um, they love this environment. And as they died, they, lay, they gradually built up layers on the, on the sea floor. And those layers, over 150 million years, have become chalk. So if you're thinking chalk with your pencil, chalk with your pen, um, the, that, that's the chalk that you see in Champagne. And on the coastlines, much like coastlines, all around islands and other areas and coral reefs, you get lots of shellfish. And the shellfish, over 150 million years, become limestone. And you can actually see this is a soil picture, and this is actually a person holding up a fossilized shell in Burgundy, 400 kilometers from the, from the sea. So in this area of Burgundy in particular, this limestone soil, the, the shellfish from 150 million years ago, comes to the surface and near the surface, and it starts inter interacting with the topsoils. And that's where the real magic happens. So if any of you have got a bit of a gardening plot, you like to garden, um, you'd like, or you, you would like to garden, you'll understand the importance of calcium. And uh, why the calcium, we're talking here with eggshells or maybe garden lime, um, is that you use it to raise up the pH level. So to make acidic soils alkaline. So remembering that chart at the start, we had all those acidic soils and, and you had all the French vineyards on the, on the alkaline soils. Now the Australian uh, vineyards get around it. We use a lot, well traditionally, a lot of Australian vineyards use a lot of lime, crushed it up, spread it around, and it gradually filters down from the surface down. But over time it washes away, so you have to keep applying it. Whereas the French, they didn't understand that science 1500 years ago, but they knew that these soils produce something pretty special. The limestone is really near the topsoil, so the lime influence comes from the bottom up, which means it's always there. It's consistent, persistent, but also importantly, it's right where the root zone wants it. And the reason why the root zone wants it is because you'll see here, it's about nutrients. So multivitamins and minerals, just like we need for our um, health and well-being, our vitamin Cs and Bs and irons, so do plants. They need their borons and the nitrogens and the magnesiums and their irons, all for the same reasons we do, for skin health, for foliage uh, uh, health, um, for immune system responses, especially if you're looking to try and get the vines to do a lot of the pest defense or disease defense, so to reduce your spraying and your use of chemicals, you want healthy vines. And you'll notice that they're all much more accessible. These minerals are much more accessible at this mildly alkaline environment. So think of it this way. So the, the soil um, has a stomach. We have our stomach, it's on the inside. When it is in balance, you know, when you had your yogurts or you're healthy, um, it's, it performs really well, you're healthy. Um, but say you've had a, a course of antibiotics or your diet's been bad or you've got some other problems, you know, you start, you notice that your whole physiology, the whole body starts not um, doing great, even up to mental health issues. So vines have their stomach on the outside. Their, their root systems are just like our stomach, job is to take in these nutrients. But they can't just take a piece of iron and take it up through a root. They need an intermediary, and those intermediaries are just like ours. All this is called our gut biome, it's the soil biome, it's the protozoa, it's the fungi, um, it's the bacteria that break this down, all this material down and make it and secrete it into the soil and make it accessible. So they are happier and healthier in this environment that's mildly alkaline, where there's limestone around for vines. And what that means is, is that the vines don't need as much soil, they become, uh, because the soils are more efficient. So if all you're talking about fuel efficiency means you need less fuel to get from A to B. Well, soil efficiency means to keep a healthy, happy vine. If the soils are efficient, you don't need as much soil 
So the big misnomer that you hear a lot about in viticulture, but it, but it a lot of, is, oh, I want deep soils, because it's great. That's human psychology. We like to think of ourselves as deep rooted, roots going deep into the earth, making us stable and strong. Vines, on the other hand, no, it's the opposite. You actually want these shallow soils. There's a really important reason for it. And this is where it starts getting into the, the wine side. So the vines are healthy with these, these soils. But the shallower soils have an advantage for grape growing. And that is looking at this picture here. On the left is table grapes. Table grapes are what we buy from the supermarket, refreshing. They're great for, you know, after a hot day, but they're full of water. They're big and succulent. That's great, but it doesn't mean there's a lot of flavor. You actually don't want too much flavor. Because on the right, you'll notice these are wine grapes, tiny, small, very intense flavors. And not that enjoyable actually just to eat, a lot of, to be honest. Um, but this is what you want for wine. You want that intensity. You want that concentration of juice. And how that comes about is because those shallow soils we talked about um, uh, are, you know, are efficient, the vine is healthy. When it rains, there's not that much moisture retained. There's not a deep um, well or soil amount of soil, large amount of soil, which retains the moisture, it's gone. So the grapes become water stressed water stress, they become smaller. So on the left, the table grapes are obviously full of water, very refreshing, done by the irrigation or deep soils. On the right, the grapes are water stressed. And so the grapes become very small and are lacking in fluid, which is great because more flavor, more intensity, really important for wine. The, the French trial and error, thousands of years, these limestone soils enabled the production of quality grapes. So. Just a quick one, Louis Roderer here, Cristal, so it's the most expensive champagne in the world. Um, 50 centimeter deep soils, very shallow. And actually this is this is their one of their vineyards here, straight onto the chalk at 50 centimeters. Or here we have Domaine Romani Conte, most expensive wine in the world. Um, very, you know, crappy soils. So, so pardon the, the technical term, but soils that are, yeah, very rubbly. Um, they've got enough nutrients, the vine is more than happy, but not retaining a lot of moisture. And it best happens on this mid slope of the hills of, of that valley in Burgundy. You know, we're talking about that best bit being maybe only a couple of hundred meters wide is that middle zone. And because erosion has washed the soil down the hill and there's just enough soil for the wine to get enough. And the deep soils and the valley floors, which have, you know, it's called colluvium, where all the soil's been pushed down there. Deep soils is where the cheap burgundy, you know, it's, it's, I wouldn't, I'd buy Australian wine over cheap burgundy any day of the week. But this middle zone, this is truly magical. So that's pretty much it in the summary. Limestone, soils, or chalk make efficient soils and they're naturally neutral, alkaline, gives a healthy, happy vine, enables a shallower soil profile. You don't need as much soil because the soil is efficient. That makes the grapes water stressed producing smaller berries, giving more flavor and structure to wine. It's called the Holy Grail in viticulture. That's why a little bit of a joke on the right. Um, obviously seeking the Holy Grail in a wine glass. Um, so that brings us to us, this little bit of a cheeky picture. This is obviously on the uh, route the Grand Vin, so the famous wine road or route through Burgundy and uh, a nice little sort of picture of us being 12,742 kilometers away, which is the diameter of the earth. So if you went straight through, you get to us from Burgundy or thereabouts. Um, but the being Burgundian, this was important. Now, this is a picture of our vineyard now. If, what you can see here is we're on a little bit of a valley, sort of uh, there's a river off to the left and there's some slopes down to it. Um, the distance across from where we're standing here to the very far side and down the other side, there's more vines, is 1.5 kilometers, so quite a distance. And the, and the width is about up to about half a kilometer wide. So very similar to Burgundy, so but that's a bit of a giveaway. A lovely, beautiful area of the world. Um, importantly for us, yes, we needed cool climate. We're looking for zone seven, which zone seven effectively means the same temperature range as probably you're getting in Europe. Um, it's cold, it does snow, um, and uh, you'll notice there's quite a bit of it in Australia. Um, mainly in on the mainland of Australia, it's altitude related in the mountains, especially up here. This is the border of, of Queensland, but down here in Tasmania, you're getting to latitude reliant. But, same, same temperature, Tasmania, as you remember, us and Tasmania were the same temperatures. Um, but really the secret to what we were there for was, was the fact that, remember that Pangea story of 
150 million years ago in Sam Neill's Jurassic era. Um, if you go back 450 million years from today, it's what's called the Ordovician era. It wasn't as exciting. There was no Tyrannosaurus Rex. It was the era of shellfish, so invertebrates. And um, what better era for the development of limestone? And at, like there was Pangaea, which was the creation story of the Paris Basin and the French regions, we had Gondwana land, which was the other great supercontinent. And you can see the various current nations sort of all squashed into it. And um, importantly, there was this chain of, of, of volcanic islands just off of barrier uh, islands of volcanoes, just off the east coast, or east coast. And um, it extended all the way up here to what you can see part of Australia was, Western Australia was above and most of Australia was submerged. And in this zone between the two, between the volcanoes and the mainland, we had quite a shallow sea, a quite a calm sea. Calm seas enable shellfish and they enable coral reef. And this is very much a similar story to Burgundy's or France's development. So what you had is you had that, as you can see this was off those volcanoes and you had this shallow sea and you had these, these li li lines of, of, um, of coral reefs and behind them obviously limestone has developed. Um, it's very old geology in Australia. So this is 450 million years old. So there's been some newer shifts since then. 250 million years ago, Sydney, where Sydney came, uh, is now was pushed out of the water. The great, the, the great dividing range, the Blue Mountains, was pushed out of the water. It's sandstone, so it's it's sea floor, different to chalk. Obviously, just general sand, and um, that's overlaid a lot of this limestone, so it does disappear. You see it if you get the chance to go to Janolan Caves, just west, west of Sydney, not far from us. Beautiful cave system um, in limestone, obviously. And um, we found this little area ourselves. Um, rather than walking around, you can find it maybe by pH, so an acidity testing kit. Um, very, it'd take a long time. The way you find limestone near surface is you go looking for, and actually very quickly, see Ralston here. You can see next to it is a little town called Tandos and where we are. The way to find this is you go looking for cement because cement is crushed limestone. And cement isn't a very lucrative product. It's not gold or platinum. You know, you're not going to go and dig it hundreds of metres from below the ground. It's got to be pretty much at the surface. And right next to Ralston, right, in, right next to it, is another little town called Candos. And Candos is very famous. It's called the, the town that built Sydney. It's a tiny town, but it had a very, very, very successful limestone business. You can see it, Candos Cement, building the Harbour Bridge, building a lot of the, the buildings of Sydney. And once we knew that, we went, we, it was inland, it was cold, very we're at high altitude, 650 metres. Um, and uh, we knew we we're looking around the right area, we found our little valley that enabled us to generate the characteristics just like Burgundy and Champagne around here. It's so like cold climate, mildly alkaline soils, real viniferous heaven or vineyard heaven, um, definitely a holy grail, um, which is great for our surname being a beautiful hideaway. So Ralston, if you ever get the chance, when you fly into Sydney and you get in a car um, or a chopper or even a light plane, um, come out, these are this is old country area, beautiful stone towns. It's 130, 140 year old. Um, I call it country light in Australia. Have yoga instructors, we have baristas making beautiful coffees. A lot of artists now live in this area in particular. We actually have the best regional yum cha in Australia. Um, beautiful story, good friend of ours, Nalan. Um, she's from China. Um, her husband, Reg, who's Australian. They met in China. She was in TV, he was in advertising, both very artistic. He had some land near us. They got married, moved there, and they decided they'd become artists and painters. But to pay for it, they realized they need to have some income source in the meantime. So she started making her family's um, dim sum and, uh, and, and all the dumplings and make them by hand. And her mum's now moved out and she's in the back room. And beautiful, like amazing terrors. Not what you expect in a country town. But so hence I call it country life, beautiful area of the world. Um, we're very lucky to be there. So um, that's the com combination of our overview. I'll talk a little bit about the wine separately and we'll do a little bit of a Q&A with the general manager shortly. Thank you.